Okay, yeah, thank you again, Chi Chung. Um, so start again from the beginning really quickly. Every graph can be approximated by a sparse graph. How exactly do we define approximation? H is an epsilon approximation of G, if and only if one minus epsilon times the Laplacian of G is less than or equal to the Laplacian of H, is less than or equal to one plus epsilon times the Laplacian of G. And um, just to be precise, A is less than or equal to B is defined to be um, B minus A is a positive semi-definite matrix. That means for every X um, in the field of these two matrices, of the two matrices B and A, um, X, tra X transpose B times B times X is gonna be less than or equal to, sorry, gonna be greater than or equal to zero. Um, and this is a pretty strong statement um, because conceptually, it leads into how we can define approximation qualitatively. Uh, one, we can say that the effective resistance between all pairs of vertices um, are similar. And uh, we'll kind of get into the precise definition of effective resistance in a couple of slides. Uh, but essentially, we can treat our network um, as an electrical circuit where the edge weights are actually the conductances uh, between uh, nodes inside our circuit. And so if you have two nodes inside um, our graph, we can try to find the effective resistance between these two nodes uh, by looking at treating like the edges as resistors and doing the parallel and series computations that you probably learned um, in physics a long, long time ago. Uh, we can also say that the eigenvalues of the Laplacians are similar. Uh, furthermore, the boundaries of all sets of nodes are similar. So the boundary of an arbitrary set of nodes or subset of nodes within a graph is defined um, to be all the edges such that uh, one node falls within you know, your set S and the other node falls outside. And we also can say that uh, solutions of linear equations um, and LG and LH are similar. So a Laplacian linear equation, uh, which we'll also see a little bit later because uh, sparsification has a good application to efficient computation of solutions for Laplacian linear equations. That just means that uh, we want to find solutions for X where LG times X is equal to some vector V uh, where B is orthogonal to the all ones vector. So we're gonna, our first attempt at uh, spectral graph sparsification is through a process known as random construction. So we're gonna randomly construct a sparsified graph H from our input graph G. So for every edge in our edge set of G, we're going to assign a probability A comma B to that edge. And uh, P A comma B is the probability of randomly including the edge A B in uh, G inside H. And uh, importantly, all these probabilities are independent. So we just go one edge at a time. And then it's like the equivalent of flipping a uh, unfair coin where, you know, heads is P A comma B. Flip it. If it comes up heads, we include the edge in H. Furthermore, we're going to do something uh, that might seem a little unintuitive at first. We're going to take the edge weight um, of A comma B and we're going to divide it by this probability uh, and that's going to be the new edge weight in our sparsified graph H. So you might ask, why do we do this? Um, this preserves the Laplacian and expectation. Uh, so if we take, we consider the elementary Laplacian, which is just the Laplacian of the edge A comma B with weight one, then we can write the Laplacian of G as a summation over all the edges. Um, and this you know, makes sense because uh, like the Laplacian itself is just computed as the subtraction of the uh, adjacency uh, matrix from the uh, degree matrix. And so everything here is just addition, subtraction. Uh, so we can kind of sum up all these elementary Laplacians and get the Laplacian for the whole graph G. Uh, if you now take the expectation of the sparse the Laplacian of the sparsified graph, we you know uh, are able to uh, do the summation over all the edges uh, because the uh, because the expectation um, can be moved inside because everything is uh, summation is linear. 
uh, we see that we have a probability a comma b term here and this w prime can be rewritten as w a b over p a b the two p a b's cancel um, and hence we're left with just the laplacian of the input graph g so just in summary the expectation of the Laplacian of the sparse phi graph is going to be equal to the Laplacian of the input graph G. Um, so this next part, uh, we're going to introduce what are called Chernoff bounds, uh, but it's going to be, I'm going to kind of give the simpler version, simpler definition of a Chernoff bound, and then we're going to rely on a paper result to extra extrapolate this uh, Chernoff bound to matrices. So all of you are probably familiar with Markov's inequality, which states that the probability that a random variable, a non-negative, a non-negative random variable is greater than or equal to some positive value is less than or equal to the expectation of that random variable over A. And so we can actually express this expectation of the random variable X as this probability of x being less than a times the expectation of x, given that x is less than a, plus the probability that x is greater than or equal to a times the expectation that x is, the expectation of x given that x is greater than or equal to a. And so just to kind of get some participation going, uh, would anyone like to explain how we get from this first line to the second line? Uh, note that X is a non-negative random variable and that A is greater than zero. Does anyone have any thoughts on how we can get from this line to this line? Okay, um, so essentially what we're doing here is we know that this probability, uh, so, this, so this expectation here is going to be um, positive uh, or actually gonna be non-negative rather because uh, the whole random variable is non-negative. Um, so we can replace this expectation term here with zero. We keep the probability X less than or is less than A. We add then probability of x greater than or equal to a times, uh, we see here that the, low, the lower bound on this term must be a. That's where all the probability is concentrated on the random variable taking on the value a, um, like probability one. Uh, but because x is a non-negative random variable and a is greater than zero, if the probability of x taking on a value higher than a had some probability greater than zero, um, then the expectation could only be greater than or equal to A. So we can replace this term with A and we get a nice lower bound. Um, and then we see here that this expectation term is greater than or equal to A times the probability of X greater than or equal to A. And that's how we get Markov's inequality. And Chernoff's inequality is just a simple extension of Markov's inequality, which, in which we just exponentiate um, the random variables on both sides of the inequality. So you'll notice that we're just doing, creating a new random variable, uh, which is the exponentiated form of how it's found in Markov's inequality. So I'm going to introduce the next theorem 32.3.1, uh, but it's essentially the matrix analog of Chernoff's inequality. And the proof is a very recent development. It's from the turn of the century. Uh, you, if you want more information on it, you can find it here. Uh, in this paper, um, but it's kind of very dense and long. And so it's kind of beyond the scope of this presentation. Um, so I definitely recommend you read through it, but I cannot present about it here. So just a statement of theorem 32.3.1. Uh, let these M uh, matrices, so these like X1 to XM be independent random 
n-dimensional symmetric positive semi-definite matrices so that the norm of any of these matrices is less than or equal to um, some finite value r. Furthermore, let x be the summation over all the matrices and let mu min and mu max be the minimum and maximum eigenvalues of the expectation of the summation. And since summation is linear, we can move the expectation. Summation is linear and these are independent matrices. We can move the expectation inside. Um, then we get these following formulas. It's not really important that you remember these right now. Um, they're kind of complicated uh, and a lot of mathematical terminology. So I'm not gonna say these out loud, but we have this bound here um, and it'll be a lot clearer why we need it when we get closer to the end of the result we're trying to prove. Uh, furthermore, with these terms, these are not super nice to work with. So we're gonna actually use these upper bounds that can also be proven. I need to understand the equation better. First, uh, what, what kind of norm are we talking about? Yes, um, so I believe uh, that's a good question. I'm not actually sure how general it can be, but I think it's safe to assume that in the paper they said Frobenius norm. Uh, so I think that's, I know for sure it works for Frobenius norm. So here R is a scalar constant? Yes. Then inside the probability, mm -hmm. here, what condition are we checking? What, what inequality? Could you explain that inequality just a little bit more? Yes, of course. Yeah, I think this notation is actually a little confusing. Um, so I want to say that the lambda min and in parentheses means the eigenvalue of this quantity, not, not multiplication. Uh, so what we're showing here is that the minimum um, eigenvalue of this summation over all the M uh, matrices we've defined up here is going to be less than or equal to one minus epsilon times the minimum eigenvalue of the expectation of the summation. So we're, yeah, we're basically saying that the uh, minimum eigenvalue of the true summation is going to be being less than or equal to one minus epsilon times the minimum eigenvalue of the expectation of the summation uh, has this bound. Okay, um, I think I got it, thank you. Okay, yeah, definitely. Um, so now I'm going to <coughs> uh, talk about how we're gonna to get to a place where we can use this really complicated relationship. Uh, so for positive definite matrices A and B, we know that if A, so if and only if A is less than or equal to one plus epsilon times B, then this relationship also holds. Um, so the neck B to the power of negative one half, so like the inverse of B and you take the square root of it, times A times B to the power of negative one half is gonna be less than or equal to one plus epsilon times identity matrix. For singular, so that means like not invertible, semi-definite matrices, that shared the same null space, there's a kind of analog relationship that holds where if the Laplacian of the sparsified graph H is less than or equal to one plus epsilon times the Laplacian of G, then we know that uh, the, it's just kind of following the similar property here. LG and with this like plus this should technically be a dagger, but dagger divided by two, uh, where that represents the square root of the pseudo inverse of LG, we get a similar relationship. Um, LG plus over two times LH times LG plus over two is less than or equal to one plus epsilon times LG plus over two LG, LG plus over two. Just take a second really quickly, just to identify the similarity between this. Um, Going talking about like the proof of this uh, will require some kind of detail, but I hope to provide the intuition through the parallel here. Okay, and then we're going to denote now this quantity, so I don't have to say it over and over again as pi, and then we're going to say 
LH is an epsilon approximation of LG if and only if this value here is an epsilon approximation, sorry, not this value here, the Laplacian of G to the power of plus over two times, this is the Laplacian of actually the sparse divide graph H times the Laplacian of G plus over two is an epsilon approximation of pi. So it's just the rephrasing of the statement here. This means that LH is an epsilon approximation of LG and that's true if and only if like this statement is true. Um, <clears throat> notice that LH, uh, because H is the sparsified graph that's being constructed through um, randomly choosing individual edges. If we wanna take the expectation of this quantity, we can move the expectation inside since LG it, plus over two is just a simple linear transformation. And since we did that thing earlier where at the expectation of LH is equal to LG, uh, we can say that the expectation of this term is just equal to pi. I'm referring to this statement up here. We showed here that expectation of LH is equal to LG. And so now we're able to show that expectation of this more complex multiplication, this complex product is gonna be equal to pi. <coughs> so a little bit more notation now. Um, and please stop me at any point because I think the notation does get a little bit dense, um, but it simplifies pretty quickly. If we create a matrix X, A comma B, and we let um, X, A comma B equal this term here, WAB over PAB times LG plus over two, LAB, LG plus over two. Remember, this is the elementary Laplacian of the graph that contains only the edge between vertices A and B with edge weight one. And we say that's with probability P A comma B and zero otherwise. <clears throat> then you'll notice that we get, <coughs> you'll notice that we get um, LG plus over two, LH LG plus over two is gonna be equal to summation over all the edges. Arjun, yes. can you go back to the last? expectation equation yes uh, can you explain a little bit more there i'm a little bit lost there okay um so are, are you referring to the last statement yeah, that one. okay um so we see we're taking the expectation over this entire quantity lg plus over two lh lg plus over two oh, hold and on hold because... on so here h is a random matrix uh, yeah, so H is the graph that's constructed through ran, uh, constructed randomly. And then um, what about G? Where do you get the G? The G is the input graph that we want to sparsify. So G is, an, is a given. Oh, G is given. G is not a, a, a random matrix. No. So we, we're given the graph G and we want to construct a sparsified graph H from G. The mm. way we do that is we randomly pick edges from G uh, with probabilities that we have, uh, probabilities that we assign. Um, and we showed here that the expectation of the Laplacian of the sparsified graph is going to be equal to the Laplacian of G, which is given. The way that, oh, okay, okay, I see. So G is the original input graph that is given to us. And then by randomly dropping some of the edges and multiplying with this P, now we got a randomized version of G, which is H. And now yes. the claim or the, the fact is that the expectation of that particular randomization process is because the, it's because the same as original LG, you are claiming that the expectation inside at the middle is LG, which is equivalent to eventually pi. Yes, exactly. That's the claim. Yes. Oh, okay, okay, I think I got it, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so please, please feel free to interrupt at any point. I, it's good to recap some of these concepts. Um, so here, I'm basically just writing this product in terms of the elementary Laplacian, doing a very similar thing to what we were doing up here, where we wrote L, where we wrote LH in terms of a lot of, sorry, we wrote LG in terms of a bunch of elementary Laplacians. I'm just decomposing um, this 
seemingly complex product into a summation. <coughs> and now we're going to pick something. I'm just gonna kind of like wave my hand and I'm gonna say, let's pick the probability of including an edge A comma B from our input graph G inside our sparsified graph H uh, with probability one over R, which is that scalar value that we were discussing earlier that bounds the norm of all these independent matrices times the edge weight for the edge between A and B times the norm of this pseudo elementary Laplacian uh, component, like pseudo elementary Laplacian piece of this uh, product right here. So LG plus over two L, so elementary Laplacian of edge A to B and LG plus over two. So you'll notice um, that if P A comma B is uniform. So if we set it to be a uh, constant value, then in expectation, sorry, in expectation, the norm rather of X A comma B is going to be equal to R. <clears throat> the reason for this is if we plug P A comma B in here in the denominator of this fraction and we take the norm of X, then the constant moves out and this becomes a norm. The norms cancel um, and the WAB in the denominator here also cancels. The R moves to the top. And uh, then because we're kind of, we're, we're doing the norm here, we can see that um, XAB is going to have a norm of R. Uh, so now you might wonder what if P A comma B, the probability of including edge A comma B using this formula we've come up here is greater than one. What do we do about that? So I just wanna quickly ask um, everyone here if they can kind of uh, foresee a good solution for when probability of A comma B is greater than one. So just a, a quick reminder um, from what I just talked about with Professor Cho, uh, we're given the graph G we're randomly picking edges in G with certain probabilities and including them in H. And H is supposed to be a sparsified version of G. Um, what can we do if the probability of A comma B is greater than one? Does that mean we just keep that edge? Uh, that's, that's close, yes. Yeah, so we definitely wanna keep the edge. Um, maybe a concrete example is what happens if probability of A comma B is equal to two? What could we do then? Two edges? Yeah, exactly. That's a great answer. So uh, we just wanna create two edges artificially between A and B, um, and then just include um, the edges A comma B, with each with probability one. So for example, if we had probability of A comma B is equal to 2.25, then we'd include two edges between A and B, and then we'd include another edge between A and B with probability 0.25. Okay, awesome. So uh, I have a question. Yes. What okay. is the origin of R? Where do we get it from? Ah, uh, yeah. So um, <clears throat> this is kind of like this is it's, this proof that I'm going to give is very similar to. Uh, it's kind of like when you're doing analysis, like a convergence of sequences. We are assuming that we have some R, we go through the whole process and then we'll find an R that satisfies the condition for us. So I'll define R in a couple of slides, um, but for now we assume we have some really good R. So we assume that R is something that is already fixed that we cannot change anymore. Yes, we'll, we'll actually fix this later. Like we, we're going through the whole process right now to and then we'll get to a simpler solution where we'll see, oh, this is a really good R that we could use, uh, but we have to go through this process first. But yes, R is fixed. Um, we're just kind of working through the process before we actually know what R is. Okay. <coughs> so now I'm going to introduce um, leverage scores. Um, so I think um, this might've been covered in a previous presentation, but the leverage score between edge A and B is going to be equal to the weight between the edge of, the weight between the edge between A and B 
um, times this quantity here. So delta A is the elementary unit vector in the direction A. That means that uh, we, delta A, the eighth coordinate inside this vector is gonna be a one and all others will be zero. Uh, and you get delta A minus delta B transpose times pseudo inverse of LG times delta A minus delta B. So this is the definition of the leverage core between A and B. Uh, there's not really a proof here. This is just, this should actually have a little definition like I have down here. It should have a definition symbol up at the top. <coughs> um, so now we're gonna take this LG plus over two times the Laplacian, the elementary Laplacian between A and B times LG plus over two. We're gonna look at the norm of this quantity um, and we're gonna break it down a little bit. The first thing we notice actually is that delta A minus delta B, uh, the outer product of this vector here with itself is actually just equal to the elementary Laplacian uh, between A and B. Um, and so I wish I wish I, I had like a drawing tablet or something like that. It's, I think it's pretty, once you write it out, it's very simple to see that that's the case. Um, but I, just to kind of recap what I just said, if we take these, uh, the outer product of these, this vector with itself, then we're gonna end up with the elementary Laplacian of just a graph that only contains two vertices A, B, an edge between them and a weight of one on that edge. So now, because this is a norm and um, norms are scalar values, the quintessential property of a scalar value is that it is equal to its transpose. So we can take the transpose of the inside of this norm, which would move this delta A minus delta B transpose all the way to the L norm. And then we can um, move LG plus over to transpose inside. Um, and then we can move, hmm, LG plus over to, if I'm taking- This is because it's pro frobenius pro venus known. Yes. When pro fro when you have a fro venus known, we can uh, convert it as a transpose or no trace of all our, tra it with the transpose and we can kind of rotate it around and then you can get the new form. That is why, why that is the case. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. Got it. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and so now that we are able to do this, uh, this transpose, um, we can actually uh, see that on the inside, we have plus over two plus over two, and we can just multiply the two together and we can get the pseudo inverse of the Laplacian of G. Um, and this is going to be equal to the effective, so by definition, this is equal to the effective resistance between the vertices A and B. Um, so actually, Professor Cho, if you don't mind really quickly, could you explain a little bit further the property of the Frobenius norm? Because I think I'm still yeah. a little confused. So let's say the norm of A, could you write it down? Oh, I, you don't have to hold. I can try with my Zoom, but I don't uh, have a drawing tablet. I can share my screen actually. Okay, I that appreciate that. Oh, where is my iPad? Oh, over there. I need to get the permission from you to share the screen. Of course. Arjun? Yes, I'm changing that right now. Okay, you should be good to go. Let me share my screen. Okay, so Frobenius norm A is equal to 
trace of a transpose a and square root. That is the, we can rewrite it this way always. You can even think about it as the definition. And then once you do that, essentially all we need to worry about is trace of a transpose a, which is the same as because of the property of the trace, we can rotate things around. So you can do trace of a, a transpose. So this is the same as square root of trace of a, a transpose. So previously what we had was that in the place of a, we had something like L delta delta L, right? So here the A was that one. So using the same kinds of uh, notation, we have trace of that trace, the transpose L delta delta L transpose L delta delta L. And then we can rotate things around. Uh, so here, trace of, what is that? Uh, uh, we put, what should we put first? These first. Okay, so we have, we rotate this to the end. So here we have delta L transpose L delta delta L, L transpose. Is it right? I think no. it's possible you have that, to add the, I think it might be that L transpose. delta is yeah, A, L. and then I think delta L is A transpose there. If I'm, if I'm yeah, not so mistaken. roughly speaking, that is what we have. So previously we had this L's outside. Now we have L's inside roughly speaking. If you actually want to be 100% accurate, let me just put the transpose actually. So if I put this here, this is the original definition, mm -hmm. the original formula that they had. L, so let me just make it a little bit more precise. LG, exact notation, LG dagger of two, delta A minus delta B, delta A minus delta B, no, delta B transpose and LG dagger over two, right? So that is A. I will use the notation of L. L so I will call this L and call this delta, then delta transpose and then L. So that is this part. So when I take the, tra uh, when I convert it through that, this becomes L, L delta, delta transpose, L delta delta transpose. So once you do that, because L is symmetric, when we take the transpose on the left hand side, other things are fine, but delta L. Uh, let me simplify that part, this part. Transpose L transpose is L. So and then delta transpose is delta, and then delta transpose and L. So that is this part. So when I multiply this one with that one, it is L delta delta transpose L, L delta delta transpose L, right? So that is the inside. Now, once I have that, what I want to do is I want to keep this one and then rotate it around to the end. So if I do that, that is delta transpose L, L delta, and delta transpose L, L delta which is the same as delta transpose L, L delta. That is what it is. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you so much. That makes a lot of sense. I will stop sharing. Okay. I didn't confuse you? It is fine, no. you were able to follow? I, I mean, I, I personally was able to follow. I think uh, um, part of it might've been at some point when I was going through step-by-step step trying to figure it out, um, I might've, you know, go, gone through similar steps, but uh, this helped re re refresh what I had kind of done earlier, maybe what I remembered. Uh, what are people able to follow as well? <laughs> um, did everyone else feel good about that? Or I I'm just asking.
Okay. Um, so uh, just to continue, um, we using this uh, similar steps to what Professor Cho just showed, uh, we actually get to a form which is uh, by definition equivalent to the effective resistance between two vertices A and B inside our uh, input graph G. Uh, and so this is kind of just what I was talking about earlier, where we can treat all the edges as resistors that are in parallel series, however the graph is structured, uh, where the edge weights are the conductances, where the, con the conductance is just the reciprocal of a resistance. Okay, and so now what we're going to do is we're going to take the summation over the edge set of our graph G, and we're going to look at all the leverage scores. So we're just going to substitute in um, the definition of the leverage score. So we saw here that the leverage score is going to be equal to the edge weight between A and B times the effective resistance between A and B. Uh, moving this down here, we saw the effective resistance is just this term. And then here, um, using, I guess like similar to what, along the same lines of what Professor Cho was talking about earlier, uh, we can essentially take the trace uh, and then kind of shuffle the contents inside. Um, and then we can move the trace outside and we can move the LG dagger outside as well and move the summation in. Um, so then what we're left with, as you can, if you recall, this outer product is just equal to the elementary Laplace in between A and B. So we're, we come up with this uh, form, the trace of LG dagger times the summation over all the edges of W, A, B, so the weight and the elementary Laplace in between those two vertices. And if you recall, this was kind of the decomposition we had come up with for the Laplace of G. So we substitute that in and the trace of this matrix, so I think we all know that this is not necessarily equal to the identity matrix. Um, it's actually like only equal to identity matrix uh, when uh, LG has a full row rank, uh, but we know that the trace the, is going to, of this product is gonna be less than or equal to N, uh, where N is the number of nodes in our input graph, G. Um, so summing over, all the probabilities uh, for all the edges in the edge set of G. We see here that, uh, let's kind of go back up really quickly. We show that this was the probability um, that we care about. It's gonna be one over R times W, uh, the edge weight and the norm of this term. And we showed that the effective resistance is equal to this norm. And the effective resistance is just going to be equal to the leverage score divided by the weight. So we can actually rewrite this probability as a leverage score divided by R. So that's what we have here exactly. The probability, summation over all the probabilities is gonna be equal to the summation over all the edges in the edge set um, of like, you know, the leverage score over R. And we were able to bound the summation over all the leverage scores uh, with the number of nodes in the graph. So we see that actually the number of edges in our sparsified graph can be upper bounded by the number of nodes in the input graph divided by R. I, I think that's a pretty, it's a pretty shocking result. It's very clean. Um, the number of graphs, the number of edges in, our, in H is going to be at most N over R. <clears throat> and so this kind of comes to uh, what Professor Cho was asking about earlier, where we're choosing R. Um, so we'll see in a second why we want this. Uh, but R is going to be equal to epsilon squared over 3.5 uh, times log N. And if this is the case, then we know that the number of edges in H 
will be at most 4n times log n times epsilon uh, to the power of negative 2 uh, with some high probability. <coughs> okay, and now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to recall an earlier fact, which is that the summation um, over the expectations of all these elements of all these XABs here. Yeah, sorry, and this is a lot of notation, so it's very hard to kind of go back and forth, um, but I'll try to walk through this slowly. So we have this definition of X A comma B here. All we're doing is taking the expectation um, over all the edges in G. And this gives us pi. Yes, so this, this gives us pi just because uh, what we showed up here was that when we're summing up over all the edge set and taking the expectation, um, this, these probabilities will cancel out. And we show that the expectation of this term itself um, is going to result in us uh, getting pi because the summation over all these elementary Laplacians is going to give us uh, going to give us expectation over uh, the Laplacian of the sparsified graph. Um, and so now this is the part that I was actually uh, a little confused about as well, but I, I kind of have a general intuition for it, but I you know, appreciate if anyone could provide insight again. If we were to project all the vectors and matrices onto the span of pi, we can actually pretend that pi is the identity matrix. And then with identity matrix, the maximum and minimum eigenvalues are going to be one. Um, so then using the Chernoff bounds we had found earlier, we can show that the probability of the summation over all these, you know, in the previous, in the theorem definition, we had shown that there is M independent um, symmetric positive semi-definite matrices. So now we're just summing up these positive semi symmetric positive semi-definite matrices are going to be our um, elementary X's. We're summing up over all the X's. And that's going to be greater than or equal to one plus epsilon times the um, sum over the expectation. And we're going to use the bounds that we had shown up above, these simple the approximations for the bounds here. And just kind of plug in. Um, again, like I, I really encourage you if you want to like walk through the calculation step by step to take a look at the slides uh, right after this. It's it's just kind of a little bit of uh, a lot of tedious um, algebra and kind of moving things around. Uh, but I hope like the big picture is clear. All we're trying to show is that this summation here, which is going to be equal to um, LG dagger over two times the Laplacian of H times um, LG dagger over two is going to be greater than or equal to one plus epsilon times pi, uh, which is the quantity we had defined earlier. And that probability is going to be upper bounded by the number of nodes in our input graph to the power of negative one over six. And so that kind of means that um, <coughs> as the input graph uh, grows, then the probability of Uh, probability that probability so the probability that LH is not the Laplacian of H is not an epsilon approximation of the Laplacian of G drops off polynomially in N. And we can kind of do a similar bound here where we're saying that um, let's go up here again. This quantity, which the result of summing up all of those X A comma B's is going to be less than or equal to one minus epsilon times pi. That's going to be upper bounded by n to the power of three over two. So the big picture here, again, uh, apologize for a lot, the a ton of notation and algebra that has to be done in these two steps. But the probability of the Laplacian of our sparsified graph not being an epsilon approximation of the Laplacian of the input graph will drop off polynomially in the number of nodes in the input graph. 
So as we, as our graph grows bigger and bigger, if we use this random construction uh, based on the values that we discussed above, the probability of H being um, a good at one epsilon approximation of our input graph G grows. And so this is convergence kind of like in probability. Second less inequality, Arjun. Yes. Why is it n to the power of three over two? Um, one minus 3.5, ooh, should, I think this might be negative three over two, actually. I, thank you for catching that. This is, if mu min is one, then 3.5 divided by two is greater than one. Uh, what is 3.5 3 greater than two is going to be, is that like 1.5 plus, so 1.75, so it should be one minus 1.75, which will get us negative 0.75. Yeah, thank you for, I think that should be minus three over four here. And here n is the number of nodes, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, I, I'll make the correction to that. Sorry about that. All right, the idea is that mu max and mu min are both one. And so if we kind of just look at this last step, 3.5 divided by two is obviously greater than one. So one minus a value greater than one is going to be a negative quantity. And therefore the probability of a plus in H not being epsilon approximation um, of the input graph G is going to drop off because, you know, as N grows a uh, negative exponent, uh, the probability will decrease. So I have a question <coughs> on how we can select R. So to my understanding, if we pick a different number for R, then we're going to have different conclusion. Mm -hmm. What does this imply? So I know that I know that it's kind of a very standard approach when trying to prove some upper bound. So we have introduced some constant, and in the end, we just uh, replace that. Uh, uh, placeholder with some concrete one, then based on that, we can have a very concrete upper bound. But still, I, I don't have the big picture, like how we can do that. And uh, if we use different R, then we're going to have different uh, upper bound. What does that mean? Yes, okay, so um, that's definitely a good question. Here, um, the R is gonna be the upper bound on the summation over all the elementary X's. And I think like ultimately with, if we look at this upper bound form here, um, the R seems to influence the rate at which the uh, number of nodes goes to, the number of nodes goes to zero. <coughs> so um, my understanding is that there's always, the R is always gonna have some dependence on the number of nodes in the input graph G. Um, and it's gonna be this logarithmic dependence like log over N. And so that leaves these factors of epsilon squared and 3.5. Uh, I think you always wanna keep this log N so that when you do the simplifications here, the log N will cancel out with this E. Um, and so ultimately the, uh, what you wanna show, what you wanna pick for R is that uh, this 3.5 and the epsilon squared uh, result in a value um, such that the rate of decay of the probability of LH not being an epsilon approximation of LG uh, drops off. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's kind of an unrealistic assumption to assume that this, this uh, sigma AB, so summation over all the elementary axes will be bounded above by this quantity. Um, but I think for the purpose of uh, explaining this proof in the lecture notes, that's kind of like the uh, approach that was used. Uh, this is like also an issue with like one of, one, like a, I think an introductory proof that they do of the, um, like the strong version of the central limit theorem in some probability theory courses, they upper bound the uh, value of X to the fourth, uh, like the, the fourth power of the random variable to kind of simplify the proof to some extent, I think that's, that's what's being done here. Um, so it's not a general proof. Uh, ultimately, you just, the, there is some kind of selection here that goes on. 
we were picking um, this 3.5 in particular so that the rate of decay of this probability is going to be negative uh, in the exponent. Is it because they wish to see a good number in the end and, and raise to the power of something? They wish to see a good kind of number there. So that's why they uh, they choose something like 3.5 in the in R. Yeah, I think that's, that's ultimately like what, what was done. Um, they wanted to show that this sparsification property holds uh, for a select set of uh, matrices. So like, again, this, the summation of over all these elementary X's is that LG dagger over two, LH, LG dagger over two, they have this unrealistic assumption in the real world that, that, um, that the norm of that quant this quantity here is going to be bounded above by R. Uh, and they just choose this R in particular to get the result that they want, that this probability is going to drop off polynomially in the number of vertices. However, like you're 100% you're right that in the real world, this property is not going to hold, in which case the proof result won't hold, um, but they're just doing it here to simplify the proof. So another question is related to the, to the understanding of, of the main result here. So when you say uh, the specified Laplacian is not epsilon opposite, approximation of the original Laplacian. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that if we increase the total number of nodes in this graph, so the specification becomes easier? So if there are many nodes there, if we just drop some edges according to PAB defined in this way, and then more likely the corresponding graph will have a very close graph of the compared to the original one. Is this the main conclusion? So yes. like bigger graph, actually, if we do specification to the bigger graph, actually uh, somehow it's, it's easier. Yes, that's, that's correct. I, I like the way I was thinking about this personally was like, if you have GB a two node graph, with only one edge, then the, if like that edge gets dropped in the sparsified version, there's it's definitely like LG is not going to be spectrally similar to LH uh, because now you have two disconnected nodes versus two nodes that are connected by a single edge, and those are very different graphs. Um, but as uh, G grows really big, um, and we have more nodes in the graph, and uh, potential for edges between these different um, nodes in the graph. If we choose with the certain that probability AB to include certain nodes in our sparsified graph, um, the, the Laplacian of that sparsified graph H is going to be a better epsilon approximation of the bigger input graph G. Okay, so uh, another question that, so um, on the different assumption of R, then we probably can derive different properties of the graph. When I say property, probably I mean, for example, the average degree of things like that, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that information somehow is encoded in this R. But I do not have this intuitive connection. Um, no, I think I think that's, that's correct because uh, here, the, it's a little bit hard to connect the two just because of the transformation we've made, um, right? Like the, the whole idea we wanted to show is that if this is true, then this is true. So the probability of this Laplacian or this matrix being epsilon approximation of pi, if that's true, then we, we know for sure that LH is an epsilon approximation of LG. Um, unfortunately, R is kind of bounding the value of this matrix and not this matrix. If it was bounding the value of this matrix, your intuition of um, properties of the average degree, um, kind of adjacency information would, would hold. Um, I'm, I think it's also difficult to kind of go backwards when you're trying to bound this to LH. Yeah, I agree. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for the questions. I really appreciate it. Somehow the numbers do not work.
work out. So I'm just trying to, I'm a very practical person. So I try to figure out how much of a saving I will get when I use this particular method. So I just plugged in some random numbers or reasonable numbers that I think I will deal with for ends and uh, epsilons, et cetera, to get the R number. And based on that R number, I try to get what is the probability that I have to sample. And they don't work out. It's actually the probability is way higher than one. So we will actually have more edges than, <laughs> than the original edges actually. Um, for just so let's say the formula that you show there r r is equal to epsilon to the raised to the power of two divided by three point five, mm -hmm. and logarithm of n, right? Yes. So let's say my epsilon error bound is zero point one. So epsilon is zero point one, and then let us assume that I have I don't know thousand nodes or ten thousand nodes. For now, let's say ten thousand. 10,000 nodes. So if I plug in the number, then I becomes 0, 0, 0. 0.0003, which is 10 to the minus four. Okay. And then P, if you go back to the P formula, P has one over R. Right. And so that's gonna and be- And W is typically one. And Laplace and AB has only one entry or essential only one edge there. So it is either positive or negative whatever small number there. So it is one over R. So it is essentially one over 10 to the minus four, which is 10 to the, 10 to the four. So the probability is way higher than one. Um, the summation of all these probabilities no, no, go back to slide. Oh, you don't have a slide number. Go back to much earlier, the sampling probability P of AB. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one. P oh, of AB is right one over R times WAB. And then the norm of the Laplacian. Yes. W of AB is the edge, edge rate. Let's say it's one. Okay. And the norm of the Laplacian, Laplacian is typically one minus two minus two. So the norm of the Laplacian is unlikely to be anything larger because it, we have only a single edge there. No? Okay. Error of AB has a single edge. So I doubt that that number will be real, either really big or small. So let's say it is one for now. That might be, that is an assumption that I made. So that might be something that I, didn't get it right, but let's assume that the second norm of the Laplacian is one, then it is essentially one over R. And I just said that when epsilon is 10%, and when we have, let's say 10,000 nodes, then R value is 10 to the minus four. So one over R is 10 to the four. So probability of given any edge, the the probability to sample is actually 10 to the <laughs> 10 to the four, meaning that we have to sample that edge 10,000 times. Okay, I, I think um, just to walk through this again really quickly here. Uh, so you said that there's a thousand nodes in the graph. Is that your assumption? Let's say 10,000. Well, 10,000 is fine too. Let me make sure to plug in that number. Okay. If you um, have so one, there's, a, in the, uh, there's a, the yeah. log term here. Um, yeah. And so if we, it doesn't really matter the cons, the base of the log. So maybe we can say that this is log base 10 for now. If we have like 10 to the four, then this should be, R should be epsilon squared over four times 3.5. Yeah, so ignore the 3.5 then. The epsilon is let's say 10 to the minus one. So 10 to the minus two. Okay, 10 to the minus and two divided by four. Uh, four, yeah. And so then if we come up here, Right, so I get, it, it. it's gonna be, a, I see what you mean. There's a big issue with like um, the epsilon value uh, for all these edges because it, it really depends on the epsilon. So like if epsilon is really small, then the probability that we, of sampling an edge is gonna be really, really high. And so then it seems really unrealistic. Um, but I just kind of wanted to come back down here where we showed that the number of edges in H will be bounded above by four times the number of nodes 
um, in G times log of the number of nodes in G times epsilon to the power of negative two. So this still suffers from the same issue um, of, you know, if you pick a completely unrealistic epsilon, then the number, the upper bound on the number of edges in H won't even, it could be like significantly higher than the number of edges in G. And that kind of corroborates um, what you, the contradiction you're kind of showing over here. However, I think if we choose a reasonable epsilon, I, I'm being very imprecise there, but if we choose a reasonable epsilon um, such that uh, maybe like 0 0.1 or something, then we'll see that the number of edges in H can be upper bounded. And generally, uh, this will be less than a complete graph over like the number of nodes n and g. Uh, so this, sh this should be much less than if all the nodes in G were completely connected to each other. But I, I, do see, I do see the issue there. Like epsilon, if you set it to be uh, way too small, then this bound is completely uh, not helpful in any way. Uh, it, the probabilities are excessive. No, and... I think the pro my problem is the following. <coughs> so you say, let's jump very reasonable number, 10% error. So it is 10 to the minus, no, 10 to the minus one. Then 10 to the minus one to the minus two is 10 to the two. So we are we have the multiplic multiplication factor of 100 and then we have the constant four. So we are multiplying it by 400. So the maximum number of edges that we will have is n square. Instead we have n times 400 at an uh, log of n. Mm -hmm. So unless log of 400 log of n is much smaller than n, we, we are not getting too much of a gain. Um, I think really so. there's a little kind of doubt. In it. Right. So uh, this is a bound on the number of edges. So this, this should be um, like 400 times n times log n. I, I don't know the distribution over the edges in G, um, but worst case if G is a complete graph and every single pair of nodes is connected, then uh, 400 times N times log N is much smaller than the number of edges in G. Okay, uh, I think I, I, this is just my minor complaint about, I actually, I kind of doubt the practicality of this particular method. That is what I'm saying. I'm just not sure whether I can figure out some numbers where this one will actually lead to practical kind of a practically much more sparse network or graph than the original input. Okay. It's kind of difficult to figure it out right now. Okay, I, I just think uh, one last thing I'll say is I just, wanted, I just wanted to clarify because uh, just so that we're on the same page, you're referring to this bound being an, uh, a bound on the number of edges, correct? And not like the number of nodes. Yeah. I think at one point you had said, this, should, this is much bigger than N. Um, so just, I just wanted to emphasize again that uh, this is number of edges in G uh, and we don't really have a good uh, intuitive, like we like all the information about the edges in G is encoded in this Laplacian, which we've kind of moved out, like taken out of the picture by bounding the leverage by the number of nodes. Okay. I'm fine, I'm fine. You can, you can move on. Move on. Okay. Um, so this is the loose ends and the open problem is that uh, I'm not going to, I don't need to cover this again, but it's basically what Professor Sun had said earlier, um, which is that uh, when you have a probability that's bigger than one, you can just essentially add multiple edges between nodes A and B. Um, and then uh, it's essentially, it's, this is just a formal definition of that. You keep on adding edges with probability one until you get to some fractional value. And then you choose to include the edge between A and B with that probability of the fractional value as well. 
And so that leaves the open question of how do we efficiently compute the effective resistance between the nodes A and B? Um, and this is because this probability term here depends on the effective resistance between A and B. We have R, some fixed value. We have the edge weight between A and B. And this term here is the resistance. Um, so we, if we can efficiently compute the effective resistance, then we can, we can use random construction um, of <coughs> the sparsified graph H uh, with the probabilities that guarantee that the Laplacian of H is going to be spectrally similar to the Laplacian of G. Okay, and so now I'm gonna kind of transition into some of the stuff that uh, the Tang book was talking about. So a big question here is, um, how should we measure the similarity between two networks? Um, suppose we have two networks. Uh, one is defined by vertices edge set um, and weights on those edges. And then we also have G tilde, which is, um, it's essentially the same, has the same nodes and uh, edges, except the weights are different. And we see that G and G tilde are, uh, there, we call them sigma linkwise similar. If there exists some sigma greater than or equal to one, such that for all pairs, <coughs> sorry, for all pairs um, of nodes in our uh, vertex set, the like one over sigma times the uh, the weight, the weight and uh, G tilde between those two nodes is less than or equal to the weight between nodes U and V, which is less than or equal to sigma times the uh, weight and G tilde between U and V. Um, so the thing is, when we have this, this definition seems to work relatively well, <clears throat> but only when the edge set of G and the edge set of G tilde are um, equal to each other. And we have this requirement that for every uh, edge in G, we should be able to compare it to an edge in G tilde, and that's a little restrictive. Hold on, hold on. I, have, I, I, I need to understand the notation just a little bit more. Okay. So G tilde has V, E, and W tilde? Yes. So why we don't have tildes on Vs and Es? Uh, so yeah, so the assumption, the restrictive assumption we're making in this first definition of network similarity is that the both graphs have the same uh, vertices and edges between them. Then what's the meaning of the last sentence? Oh, so the thing is like, uh, when we're doing sigma linkwise similarity, uh, if two graphs are sigma linkwise similar, then that necessarily restricts them to having the same edge set. That's all I was trying to say there. So here, the last sentence somehow assumes that we know the node correspondence, but the edges can be different. Edges can be different. That's kind oh, of sorry. Right. So the notation is um, like, it's, I understand the confusion here. So there is really no E tilde. E, like E, this should be E tilde, but it's exactly the same as E. That's why I've defined it with E here. So the node, cor the, ver the edge correspondences are exactly the same for both graphs. Okay. I have one more general question. Later, do we relax the assumption of we knowing the node identity or node correspondence, or we don't relax that assumption? We relax it. Uh, we're going to we're going to get into the concept of spectral similarity next. Okay. Good. Thank you. <coughs> um, so now, suppose we have two networks. Uh, so we actually we don't. Um, I should clarify. So we actually assume that two networks. Uh, for the case of spectral similarity, have the same nodes, but they have different edges. So like this E, e tilde and E are now different, potentially, um, but the vertices still stay the same. Um, and this is just for the sake of uh, being able to compare the Laplacians. Like we want to make sure we have the same dimensions for both G and G tilde. So then we also have W and W tilde 
as usual. <coughs> and um, the Laplacian of W um, and Laplacian W tilde are the same definitions that we've seen since the beginning, just the degree matrix minus the adjacency matrix. And then uh, we're gonna have a parallel definition for what it means for two graphs to be sigma spectrally similar. So we say that if there exists a sigma greater than or equal to one um, for all X in the field of n-dimensional real, num uh, n -dimensional, uh, real numbered vectors, then one over sigma times X transpose uh, times the Laplacian of W tilde times X is gonna be less than or equal to X transpose times the Laplacian of W times X which is going to be less than or equal to sigma times x transpose Laplacian W tilde times x. So that's a mouthful, but um, the idea here is that one over sigma times this quantity where we're substituting in the Laplacian W tilde and sigma times this quantity where we're again substituting in the quantity of the Laplacian of W tilde are going to be lower and upper bounds of this term here. Um, and so you might realize that we're saying that two graphs are sigma spectrally similar, um, but this could hold for like varying uh, quantities of sigma, especially if you make sigma very large, then uh, then like you know the bounds could still hold, but they might not be as tight as possible. <coughs> so what we say is that the actual sigma that defines the spectral similarity between two different graphs, G and G prime, is the infimum of this set, where uh, a set of all sigma primes such that G and G prime are sigma prime spectrally similar. So we're trying to take this uh, lower bound over all the feasible um, sigmas that satisfy the spectral similarity definition. And then we define the spectral, actual spectral similarity between G and G tilde to be equal to one divided by this uh, infimum over all the feasible sigmas. And this is because we are checking if there exists a sigma greater than or equal to one. So to normalize the similarity scores, because we usually use similarities between zero and one, so we want it to be between zero and one, therefore we just take the reciprocal. And we see here that because we're looking for the infimum, um, with a lower, uh, lower sigma, if you can get a lower sigma, then the spectral similarity between two graphs is gonna be higher. <coughs> um, so we're gonna go through a quick example here that's gonna make use of some properties that we had derived in earlier presentations on uh, the Laplacians of very common graphs uh, like hypercubes and uh, star graphs and ring graphs. So let's say we have Kn, and that's the complete graph on n vertices, where each edge has weight one. Now let's suppose that H log n is the log n dimensional hypercube with edge weights n divided by two over the square root of log n. Uh, we'll see why we want that exactly in a couple in the next slide. <coughs> but all non-zero eigenvalues of the Laplacian of K are gonna be equal to N. And that's just a property of complete graphs that we had derived earlier. Furthermore, the non-zero eigenvalues of the Laplacian of a, of a unit weight log N dimensional hypercube are two, four, six, eight, all the way up to two times log N. Um, where each eigenvalue two times k has this multiplicity. Uh, what so this is, is hypo, what is a hypercube? Uh, yeah, so um, I cannot remember the exact definition from the previous slides. I don't remember, is the person who presented that here? It's essentially where you start off with um, like a one dimensional hypercube is just two nodes connected by an edge. Um, a two-dimensional hypercube is a square. A three-dimensional hypercube is... I see. I think Shirley presented that. that that's like using Krochnikov product to... 
go from just one edge to high dimensional hypercube. Uh, Shirley, if you wanted to mention something about that really quickly. Okay, I think Shirley muted herself, but yeah, that, that's correct. You're, you're basically, there's a, um, a sequence that's, on, that's based on the Kronecker product that event, lets you get to higher dimensional hypercubes. Okay, so um, these are just, again, results that have been proven already. Uh, we're going to take them at, for granted, and then we're going to try to show the spectral similarity between K and H. <coughs> um, so for all X in Rn, there exists some kind of alpha such that X is equal to alpha times the all ones vector plus some other uh, vector Z. And from this definition, we know that Z is actually orthogonal to the all ones vector. So we're basically just decomposing X into a linear combination um, of alpha times all ones vector plus some vector z that's orthogonal to all ones. So let's take a quick look at what x transpose L, the Laplacian of k, which is our complete graph, times x looks like. So substituting in what x is, that's alpha 1 plus c transpose. And then we saw that the Laplacian of our complete graph has this form, n times the identity minus the all ones vector times the all ones vector transpose. And then, I mean, this is, this is uh, pretty clear because all nodes have degree n and then um, the adjacency matrix is just all ones. Like every single entry has a value of one. So degree minus adjacency is going to get us the Laplacian of this complete graph. And then X is alpha times one plus Z. <coughs> um, here, we're going to essentially do some multiplication out. Uh, so I'm just kind of doing simple matrix multiplication here. N times alpha one transpose plus NZ transpose. If you kind of take this uh, walk through the steps here, to foil out um, all of this multiplication. Um, the primary thing to keep in mind is that Z is actually orthogonal to the ones vector. So that allows for cancellation because then we know that this term, for example, here is gonna be equal to zero. And that's, that's kind of the crux of this simplification. So after a lot of <coughs> multiplication, we're able to eventually reduce X transpose LK times X to this really nice quantity here, which is just N, the number of nodes times Z transpose Z. Um, and then similarly, we can actually show here that X transpose times the Laplacian of H times X is gonna be equal to Z transpose times the Laplacian of H times Z. And that's, uh, because the eigenvector corresponding to zero, to the zero eigenvalue, um, is the all ones vector in um, our hypercube. Um, so kind of looking at the lower and upper bounds on Z transpose LHZ, um, we see that because the edge weights as we defined up here to be n over two square root of log n, um, they kind of, they can be pulled out from this Laplacian. Um, and then we see that the minimum and maximum eigenvalues of this Laplacian of H, which is actually defined on, if you remember, unit weight hypercubes, the lowest one is going to be two. The largest one is gonna be two times log n. So we know that this quantity Z transpose LHZ is gonna be um, in this in this range, edge weight times two, the interval two to two log n times z transpose z, and doing some simplification here, we see that we get n times the interval one over square root of log n to square root of log n times z transpose z. 
And, <coughs> excuse me. So um, here, you'll, if you remember the definition of spectral similarity, we're looking for some sigma greater than or equal to one such that this property is true. Here we have n times z transpose z. Here we have n times this interval z transpose z. So we know that uh, the if we're using the if we're using the uh, z transpose LAZ would, for the hypercube as the bounds on this quantity here, we can find that actually kn, so the complete graph and the modified edge weight log n dimensional hypercube are sigma equals square root of log n spectrally similar. And so what this implies is that the spectral similarity between a complete graph and a log n dimensional hypercube um, decreases with the square root uh, of log times a uh, square root of log of the number of nodes um, in the complete graph. And so I just wanted to pose a question. This is kind of an application of this result that we've just derived. Um, would you use hypercubes or complete graphs for parallel computer architecture and like quantum computer circuitry? And why might we use one over the other? You cannot have too many edges, so definitely need to have hypercube. We cannot use the complete graph when n is large. Yeah, exactly. So um, we have a lot of, I, I can talk maybe about quantum computer circuitry. Um, in a quantum circuit, we have a lot of qubits. And ideally, when someone specifies a program at a high level, we'd want to be able to operate on every single pair of qubits, but this is unfortunately not the case. Um, because that would require connections between all pairs of qubits in the physical circuit. Um, and so since, a, since like Professor Cho pointed out, a complete graph is not feasible, uh, we can go for an approximation. And we see here that because the, the, um, the hypercube is one over square root log n, has the one over square root log n um, spectral similarity to the complete graph, it's a really ideal candidate. Um, and you might be thinking like, well, the, with a lot of qubits, with a lot of um, nodes in your parallel computer architecture, the spectral similarity decreases, which is true, um, but it's a lot better than one over n to the four or like one over n squared. Uh, it decreases a lot slowly, a lot more slowly. <coughs> so, Adrian, thank you for bringing up this discussion. So actually, um, I was thinking about uh, another application application here. So if we consider BERT, right, we essentially for a chunk of sequence of text. So BERT tried to get this like four dense attention matrix. So essentially it considers the interplay between any two words in that chunked sequence. So essentially it's a complete graph, right? Mm -hmm. And then definitely will cause lots of computation issues. So if we can, we can do some sort of specification, I'm not sure whether hypercube makes sense here, but if we can do some specification to that complete graph, so even we have a sequence potential, we need to consider the pairwise interaction. So we just consider a specified structure, whether that will significantly enhance the training speed of bird. Probably we can think about that. Yeah, that's a really awesome idea. Um, I think like currently what's being done is uh, there was a there was a blog post actually recently <clears throat> released that like yes uh, the transformer is equivalent to like a, a simple uh, uh, GCN that's operating graph convolutional network that's operating on a complete graph where all the words are uh, connected to each other like Professor Sun said and what essentially it's doing is it's trying to find it's like optimizing to find a good approximation to the complete graph um, with like semantic meaning flowing through the edges. So by modifying the edge weights, it's trying to sparsify this complete graph to a structure that's good enough um, for uh, good word embeddings to be learned um, that can kind of capture the uh, capture context, capture semantic meaning 
uh, polysemy and all these other kinds of uh, things that are related to natural language. But yeah, I, I think that's a really good idea, Professor Sen. We should definitely um, consider in terms of speeding up this, uh, this calculations. If we can find some kind of matrix multiplication for those keys, uh, queries, um, and other things related to BERT that only operates on the hypercube instead of the complete graph, it might uh, speed up training time by a lot. Okay, so um, spectral similarity, that's a, uh, uh, so it, spectral similarity is actually like a, a specific case of what is more commonly known as distance similarity in measure theory. And two metric spaces M uh, that we define um, over uh, the, yeah, so two, 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 sorry, two uh, measure, metric space we define over um, a set of nodes as well as a distance measure. So M and M prime, where these distance measures could be potentially different. Um, are sigma distance similar if, and again, this is like very similar to what we had shown earlier. Uh, it's just kind of analogous to everything we've been looking at so far. If the uh, distance tilde between UV uh, is able to do, be a good bound for the distance between nodes U and V, then uh, these two distance metrics are uh, sigma distance similar. And the reason spectral similarity is a special case of distance similarity is because we're actually, the distance here is actually just the effect of resistance between two nodes U and V. So all we're saying is that um, for M, the distance metric between U and V is the effect of resistance between U and V. And then M tilde is the effect of resistance induced by uh, W tilde between two nodes U and V. And so spectral similarity implies effective resistance distance similarity and vice versa. Um, and so the big questions here um, for sparsification are go over the second claim, which is that which net each network induces a natural metric space. Could you explain that just a little more? Of course, yes. Yeah. So the induction of this natural metric space is the effective resistance. Um, so the part of the network that induces the metric space is actually uh, the W. And the reason for that is because we can define a distance between two nodes U and V in a graph to be equal to the effective resistance between the two nodes, which is the you know delta U minus delta V transpose, and then the Laplacian, the pseudo inverse of the Laplacian of W times um, delta U minus delta V, uh, and we we actually find that with this. Uh, definition of distance. Uh, this is exactly the same as spectral similarity as we had shown earlier. Um, because we can actually write uh, this, these x transpose x are essentially equivalent to um, this one, this delta u minus delta v, delta u minus delta v. Okay, I want, I need a little bit more <laughs> step by step. Uh, why is it all, why is it natural? Uh, I, I think uh, that natural is just like, like English, like it's not, um, it doesn't have any mathematical implication. I, I just meant that like the, if it's not, it's actually not supernatural. Like it, the idea is that uh, we have this definition of what it means for effective resistance um, and that, effective resistance is based on W and that's why it induces a metric space. I think we can disregard natural. Why is it a metric space? Um, yeah, so please uh, please feel free to jump in because I, I don't have you know the best background in measure theory, but the idea here is that with X being a set of nodes and the distance metrics we're passing into our, our metric space is effective resistance. Um, 
and that's kind of so why in order to prove something as a metric they need to satisfy triangle inequality is it kind of almost obvious that somehow when we define it that way it means the triangle inequality um it's a, it's a good question i don't i don't see it immediately but let's see if you have if you have the distance between two nodes and then you add the distance, the, sorry, the effective resistance between two nodes and then you add the effective resistance between another two nodes, will that be greater, will that be greater than or equal to the effective resistance between the two of them to begin with? Um, I think like from what, from what I can understand, this is just using like the physical intuition that physics provides that if you have more resistance, like more resistors between any two vertices in your circuit, you will likely have a greater distance between them in terms of resistance. Uh, it seems that the triangle inequality should hold, but I can't think off the top of my head of a rigorous proof of that triangle inequality for effective resistances. So I want to clarify the notation here. When we define the distance, we use L sub W pseudo inverse. Why do you use the notation W as opposed to G? That is what we used before. Any particular reason? Um, yeah, okay. So, well, one reason is maybe I should have been better about this, but the W is just the notation that was used in the chapter from, from the Tang textbook. Um, so they kind of, Tra they transition to a new notation. So I'm sorry for that being confusing. Uh, so uh, I, the other stuff is like, because W is like the edge weights, it also contains information about the adjacency um, matrix. So it, it inherently encodes information about the entire graph. I, I tried to clarify uh, the claim here. Do you say that for any network, it can induce a matrix space as defined in the third bullet? Um, any network with uh, positive edge weights, it can induce the metric space in the third bullet. Um, I think the assumption here is that the, all the conductances which are given by the edge weights have to be greater than zero. Uh, so that we have non-negative resistances that are finite. Previously, so there are some work, they're saying that, okay, graph here has this kind of local similarity, but uh, it's not a, re a rigorous matrix space. So people try to kind of do some kernelization on the, on the ATZ matrix also, try to make it more rigorous. But here somehow it implies that we don't have to do any additional thing. But it's too good to be true, right? So. Yes. Um, is, is it possible that in the words that other people have been showing that there's not a guarantee that the edge weights are positive? Or were they also showing that uh, even with positive edge weights that it was not rigorous, that you could show that's a metric space? That's my understanding. Okay, so that even, even when it was positive edge weights, it still could not be rigorously shown. Yeah, but probably we're not talking about the same thing because for those papers, they're more like whether this graph uh, naturally give us a good kernel. Uh, of course, kernel is not the matrix space we, we are talking about right now, but it's just a, some intuition I got, okay, for the natural graph or real world graph, usually it's not that rigorous connecting to some good mathematical properties. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that we have a, such a good property here. Um, yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the difference then between this result that was presented and what's been studied outside is like, I think, as I was saying earlier, it, it seems, and this is just like not rigorous still, but like, the, it seems that when you try to find the resistance between two nodes in a circuit, the further you move along resistors, the, the higher the voltage loss 
will be, uh, which suggests that, like, you know, the distance is, you know, monotonically increasing. Yeah, I believe the, 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 the uh, magic thing is that ERW, so it kind of redefine the distance between any two nodes. That will give us this guarantee. Okay. Uh, could If you don't mind really quickly, could you explain that again? Uh, what about the W? I guess W still can be random given, as you mentioned, but for the ERW, that means like how to leverage the W to define the, uh, the distance between any two nodes. So it has to follow the definition in this way. And then that gave us a matrix space. And previously, probably people just naively treated the agency matrix as a similarity matrix. Okay. So that will cause trouble, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, that's definitely an interesting question. I, um, yeah, I, I think like I'm very curious. So maybe like after this as well, I'll try to go and look at uh, a good rigorous proof for showing the triangle, demonstrating the triangle inequality with this effective resistance when their edge weights are positive. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a, thank you for both Professor Cho and Professor Sun for bringing those up. Um, okay, so I see we don't have a, a lot of time left. So I'm going to try to cover as much as I can with like the big questions um, and then go into one application, which is uh, the a scalable algorithm for uh, solving Laplacian, uh, for solving uh, Laplacian linear systems with the assumption that we have a scalable algorithm for sparsification. So a couple of the big questions are how, to, how do we measure the similarity between our sparse graph and the original? Um, for a choice of graph similarity, does every graph have a similar sparse graph? <coughs> so we actually show it not as rigorously. Um, there's, there's more complicated proofs out there actually based on um, the relationship between spanning trees and leverage scores. Uh, but I wanted to you know, be able to present something that was understandable. Uh, those proofs are a little bit longer and a little bit te more tedious. Uh, but we essentially showed loosely in the previous slides that H is one plus epsilon spectrally similar to G just through that process of random construction with the appropriate probabilities of including different edges. And uh, the next question that we're gonna delve into right now is, does there exist any scalable algorithm for constructing a good sparsifier? Um, because as we saw, there is an issue with computing the effective resistances that we still are struggling to find a good algorithm to compute to quickly compute the effective resistance between every pair of vertices in a graph. Okay, so um, some work that has been done in scalable algorithms for spectral sparsification. Uh, Spielman and Tang uh, designed the first scalable. I don't understand the question of algorithm, algorithm question. What is the question? Okay, so. Um, the question that's equivalent to this is, is there a good way for finding the effective resistances between every pair of nodes, which will give us the probabilities that we need for the random construction? Uh, the, the sparsifier here refers to the probabilities. Uh, it was, is it still, the wording still a little bit uh, confusing? Why is it hard? Like the previous sparsification algorithm that we learned works, then isn't that the algorithm, no? Oh, right. So it, uh, the algorithm works, but it's not scalable. Um, it's actually, if I recall correctly, it's like polylogarithmic with like a huge exponent. Um, and so that leads to some issues with, uh, with how exactly we can compute all the effective resistances. In a, in, a, in a efficient amount of time when the graph has a, like a large number of nodes. Okay. Okay. Um, so one, one scalable spectral classification algorithm that was found, but still suffers from this polylogarithmic term with large exponent is uh, they decided to decompose network, the network into well-connected components 
Um, and they did it in such a way that we could guarantee that the smallest non-zero eigenvalue of the normalized Laplacian matrices of all these components was um, on the order of one over log squared n. And uh, this is a relatively large value uh, given the, it's, at least it's larger than one over n squared or one over n to the fourth, it's a relatively large value for the uh, first non-zero eigenvalue, which indicates that all these components are pretty well connected. So we're actually breaking up this network based on the weakest links that exist within the network. Um, and that allows us to, like we can recursively then sparsify edges within each of these components uh, using the connectivity. And then we can like stop uh, this construction of well-connected components uh, when uh, there, we've determined with some threshold on the first non-zero eigenvalue that the components are no longer being well-connected. So essentially what we're doing is recursively uh, dropping some edges from well-connected components. And if we keep on doing that, we're gonna get a sparse graph that is um, a pro that's, that's decent for the entire input graph G. Um, and now we wanna check well, we have this algorithm from before that seems to work really well with um, the provable bounds of the sparse graph being um, epsilon approximately similar to, sorry, one plus epsilon approximately similar to the input graph G. So uh, we wanna see if there's a good way to compute these effective resistances. I'm not gonna get into the data structure here because it wasn't in the assigned chapters uh, but chapter seven of the textbook contains um, a good section on how Spielman and Srivastava developed an efficient data structure for the computation of these effective resistances. Okay, so I'm gonna try my best to get through this um, in the last eight minutes, but um, sorry if I don't make it the entire way through. We have Laplacian linear systems. Um, and as I said earlier, this is when we want to find all the x such that we have our Laplacian times x and it's equal to b. <coughs> um, and b here is an n-dimensional real valued vector that is orthogonal to the all ones vector. And the claim is that uh, we can actually solve Laplacian linear systems. So again, where this weights matrix here is a Laplacian matrix in big O of n squared time using scalable spectral sparsification as a subroutine. However, it still is an open question if there exists big O of n squared algorithms for approximate solutions, so even approximate solutions of A times X equals B, even when A is symmetric and positive definite. So um, like there, there still don't exist um, O of n squared algorithms for solving this equation here, a x equals b, when even when a is symmetric and positive definite. So the fastest algorithm that exists for such a system is uh, the conjugate gradient method, where we have um, our conjugate matrix. And uh, I have the, the pseudocode in a couple of slides, but it guarantees for positive, symmetric positive definite matrices that with n iterations, you can converge upon a solution um, for X such that this system here is satisfied. However, the bottleneck in the conjugate gradient method is the matrix vector product in each iteration. Um, and that's essentially uh, N, so that's the number of iterations um, that the conjugate gradient method takes. And then the multiplication of this matrix A with our current um, candidate X at every iteration is going to be on the order of the number of non-zero entries in A um, using like the most efficient matrix multiplication algorithms. And so this is gonna be N squared. And so we're gonna get a runtime of big O of N cubed on um, the whole conjugate gradient method. Um, so one thing that we can talk about here is the A norm of a vector Z. The A norm is the, it's defined as this. Uh, essentially, we're 
shoving in the matrix A in between this dot product, the inner product rather, and, and before we take the square root. And um, this is a theorem for the convergence of the conjugate gradient algorithm that says that if X star is our exact solution, then the, uh, the number of iterations for conjugate gradient to obtain an approximate solution is going to be uh, on the order of the square root of the condition number A times log of one over epsilon. And what this condition number indicates actually is that if um, a matrix is almost singular and the, con the, like the, con the computation of its inverse is going to be prone to large numerical errors uh, because it's like highly sensitive uh, since it's very close to having its determinant be equal to zero. So even in the solution of linear systems of equations involving um, these matrices with large condition numbers, uh, we actually want to do what's called preconditioning. Um, we want to introduce preconditioning into our conjugate gradient method. Um, so this is essentially a, the tactic we're going to use uh, to reduce the runtime of our uh, solution for these Laplacian linear systems. <coughs> so what we're going to do is set here, instead of solving, instead of solving A times Y is equal to B, we're going to solve M to the power of negative one half uh, times A times M to the power of negative one half times Y is equal to M to the negative one half times B, um, where M is known as the precondition matrix. And then what we're going to say, we want to solve for X. Uh, so if we can find Y, then we know that X is just equal to M to the negative one half times Y. That's just this term here. And then both sides are going to be equivalent, giving us a solution to the original uh, linear system. Um, and what you'll notice is that it doesn't seem like this, there's, there's uh, much going on here. It doesn't seem like this is actually helpful because it seems to involve more matrix multiplications. Um, but if you're interested in the preconditioned conjugate gradient method, you will see that it only involves this matrix multiplication by the inverse here and here. And that's the only difference between the original conjugate gradient and the preconditioned conjugate gradient. Um, and you can prove that the solution y will actually be the result uh, that will actually be the result of n iterations on the preconditioned conjugate gradient method. So if we let um, L tilde be a sigma spectral sparsifier of L, then for all y that is ortho orthogonal to one, <coughs> we can actually let z be equal to L tilde to the power of negative one half times Y. Um, we're trying to compute the condition number here. Um, so we plug in Y transpose Y, Y transpose Y, and then this is our uh, precondition matrix. We see that this, through this, uh, you, like this definition of Z, the top is gonna be equal to Z transpose LZ bottom is going to be equal to Z transpose L tilde Z. And by the definition of sigma spectral sparsification, this value is going to be in the range one over sigma squared to sigma squared. Um, and so based on how, how uh, similar your sparsifier gives you a graph that is to L, um, you can get a constant condition number that can be really low if we use this preconditioning matrix here where M is gonna be equal to L tilde negative one half L, L tilde negative one half. Um, and because this const, this uh, precondition number is going to be on the order of a constant, then we see that precondition conjugate gradient only requires big O of log over one of epsilon. Uh, and the iteration is to solve our Laplacian system. And that means that we can actually solve LX equals B to epsilon precision um, in big O of N squared log of one over epsilon. Because on each iteration, eight o'clock. 
on each iteration, uh, we require big O of the number of non-zero entries in L, uh, like O of n squared, uh, to compute the matrix vector product involving L that still has not gone away. Um, but on the other hand, we like for each iteration, we only need to compute the inverse um, of this preconditioned matrix L tilde. And the computing the inverse because um, this is a sparsified version of the original Laplacian uh, is a lot easier uh, because the number of non-zero entries uh, is going to be linear compared to uh, the potential n squared non number of non-zero entries in the original Laplacian. So then we get big O of n squared. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, I do have a meeting right now. So I just wonder like uh, how many slides do you have? Okay, I, I was just gonna stop after this. Um, there's also some stuff about page rank that I've included, but I was just gonna end right here. Uh, so okay. To, to invert, invert L tilde. And because each iteration we're doing N squared um, and we're, there's log one over epsilon iterations, the computation of the inverse at the very beginning, which we only need to do once is big O of N squared. That gives us an overall runtime of big O of N squared log of one over epsilon. And that's much better than big O of n cubed. And uh, that's the end of the presentation. OK, thank you. So it's a very nice uh, presentation. So if you want to continue the remaining part next week, I'm not sure because I already find a week. Right? But if time allows, do you mind finish your part next week? Um, sure. I, I think like maybe if uh, Zinyu can go first, and then if there still is some time afterwards, I can, I can try. But I, I want to give uh, priority to Zinyu since he worked hard on his presentation as well. But yeah, it's okay. We can uh, continue the presentation next semester. So I think it is for better of the continuity. Uh, maybe you can continue to finish your presentation next week. And I, if there's some uh, more time, I can uh, do my part. And if I, I'm not finished, I can move on next semester. The next okay. quarter, yeah. That sounds good. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.